Welcome, Classic Worship Service. We are so grateful you are here on the 22nd of November, our final message in our series called Choosing an Adventure with God. This has been a series about stewardship, and I just want to thank you on behalf of the entire session, the entire church, for the pledges that you have sent in that are literally making this church able to continue. We know that you are doing it not because you are doing it in order to get patted on the back, but because of your commitment to God. To that end, this afternoon from 12.30 to 1.30, in our church parking lot, we will have a drop-off pledge time where you can drive up and there will be a pastor there to pray with you as you drop off your pledge. But now as we say every Sunday and we say again, this is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Sunday, the prayer of confession is a time for us to take an inventory or to do an accounting of our thoughts and actions and see where we may have fallen short of being the person God desires us to be. I know this week I have been too sharp with my words. I have been too quick to judge others, and I have remain silent when I should have spoken up. Perhaps the same has been true for you. So join me now as we come to our prayer and let us lighten the burdens that weigh us down. Please join me. God, we pray that you will bend your ears to hear the murmurings in our hearts today. We want to be grateful but are too often focused on the things that are not right in our lives to truly enjoy the gifts you give us. We want to be kind and caring, yet our own neediness prevents us from nurturing a spirit of generosity. We have been too distracted to notice when words of encouragement or comfort for others are needed the most. We try to hold our tongue, but our own stress and impatience often get the best of us. Hear us now as we pray our individual prayers of confession.
forgive us. Light a fire in our hearts today, a fire of kindness, generosity, and care towards others and towards ourselves, one that shines your light into our world. Amen. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. That sounds like a really good promise to me. So know that you are forgiven and be at rest today. Well, let us join together in singing the Gloria Patri. Experiencing the peace of Christ today, I invite you to share that peace by picking up your phone and texting the peace of Christ be with you to someone else. And if you are in need of the peace of Christ today, I invite you to text someone and ask them to pray for you. The peace of Christ be with you. Hey, classic worship service. Hey, modern worship service. We are so grateful for both of your worship services and the way that you worship God in your own unique way. We're so grateful for those who are watching from around California. We say a special hello to our friends in Goleta, California. And I want to say last week I preached on secret gifts. One of you in Goleta sent me a secret gift of dried persimmons. I have enough for like a year. Thank you so much for that. Lots going on this weekend. Wow, I can't believe it. So today is our kickoff for our wreath-making experience. That is our Advent wreath-making experience. We thank our next-gen team for that. Special thank you to Louise and Don Arata, Jody Lowry, Linda Duncan, and Sonu for putting those bags together. Here's my own kids putting their wreath together. Oh, the weather outside is frightful. Mm-hmm, can't remember the rest of the words, but that's our wreath-making experience. Then I was so proud of our church on Friday and Saturday. 100 of you came out and put together these amazing care boxes for our Latinos United community, and they are going with love, and lots and lots of clothes are going along with that. 100 boxes and 100 volunteers. Fantastic job. Also, today... You won't want to miss this. Our first ever drive through pledge day. Now, we've never had to do this before, but this is a lot of fun. Our stewardship committee, directed by the amazing Don Clark and an incredible team of people, have put together a fun event for handing in your pledge. Today at 12.30 to 1.30, we have free gift giveaway, raffle, we have a comedian. This is my pledge, and it is going in the mail. Star and I's pledge is going in the mail today. Actually, I can just hand it in because I'm right here at the church. So this is our final announcement for the morning. On December the 6th, you've heard about this, we have our first in-person outdoor worship service at 10 a.m. Now, as everybody knows, our COVID crisis seems to be getting worse in California, and we've had to modify. Many thanks to our VERT team for all the hard work they're doing but we won't be able to do in-person communion that day, but we will be sending you with an in-person home communion kit that you can take with you. We have rented a huge LED screen. The reason for this is your safety and that you can experience the worship the same way that everybody else does. You have to sign up online for that. But also, if you can't or don't want to make it down to the church, don't worry about it. We are still doing our 10 a.m., modern worship service, and our 11 a.m. classic service on that day. Just yet another opportunity. 
So today is our final message of our series we've called Choosing an Adventure with God. And in this series, we have sort of based it on that children's book series, Choose Your Own Adventure. We saw that as children have a chance <clears throat> through that book series to choose one of many 20 different endings to a story, that you and I have a chance to choose how the story of 2020 and 2021 will end. We get to choose. We have a God who gives us the ability to be a part of God's adventure. And so we looked at that the first week. Interestingly, one of the most famous narrative psychologists invented a therapeutic approach with his patients in which at the end of a session, he would look his patient in the eye and he would say, okay, so how does the story end? How does your story end? And in a sense, what we are hearing from God today is that God is looking you and I in the eye today and saying, okay, but how does this story end? How does your story end? The next week, we took a look at that text, which is worth memorizing, that amazing text that talks about in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. We saw that when we are in the midst of our toughest trials, that we also have access to our highest joys, and that in between that space is our best space for giving and for generosity. And then last week, we took a look at being secret givers. We saw that God does miraculous things when we do secret giving. And I suggested that perhaps Jesus himself was the most generous secret giver there ever was. He was always giving, but always saying, shh, this is just between us, because it was a sacred act. And we encourage you to continue to be secret givers. So today on this last day of the stewardship series, I want to move away a little bit from the topic of money and move towards something that is equally, if not more important, and that is what we do with our lives. That is the good things that we do. I want to focus on good deeds and doing good. But first, would you pray with me? Thank you, God, for taking us through this season. Many of us watching today are heading into a Thanksgiving week, which, which won't be the kind of Thanksgiving that we would really like to have. And yet we know because of you and because of your gifts and your promises that there is still hope and that there are still things to be excited and joyful for. Be with us, Lord, as we look at our final message in this stewardship series. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, this last week, I had a tougher experience than I've had for a long time, and that is I lost one of my very best friends on the face of the earth. His name was Chuck Ford, and this is a picture of Chuck taken just a couple of years before he died. To say that Chuck had an impact on my life would be one of the greatest understatements. He was a surrogate grandpa for me. He was a mentor for me. He was a prayer partner for me, and he was a friend. And he died at Hogue Hospital in Newport Beach just earlier this week. By the way, our friends, the Ford family, are watching from Newport Beach, and we welcome you, and we send our condolences. But let me tell you a little bit about why Chuck Ford was such an important part of my life. I knew Chuck for about 16 years. And it was when I was a pastor, an interim pastor in Red Bluff, California, that I got a call one day on the phone and he said, hi, this is Chuck. And he explained that he was a wealthy real estate developer from Orange County, that he and his wife, Pat, had done very well in real estate development but that the way he and his wife, Pat, wanted to spend the rest of their lives was to, to, to use all of the money and the wealth and the riches that they had earned in real estate to start incredible, out-of-the-box, mind-blowing, meeting people where they are, new church developments. So after that long introduction, he said, and I hear, Graham, that you are a new church developer, and would you like to come to Paso Robles and start a new church with me. Now, many of you know that I had tried a few years before I was in Red Bluff to start a new church in San Antonio, Texas. And if you remember the Alamo, it didn't go so well for them, and it didn't go so well for the new church that I started there in San Antonio 
It didn't succeed. And I was quite down on my luck. I was quite discouraged. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm just going to find a sweet little Northern Californian farming town to hang up my cleats for the rest of my ministry. I said, Chuck, thanks for the invitation. But you know, I, I don't know if you got the right guy. And I just don't think that that I want to do this now. So I appreciate the offer and honor, but uh, no thanks. Chuck paused for a couple of moments and he said, great, I'll see you a little later in the week. Clearly, Chuck was not taking no for an answer. Now, I, I don't know what I was thinking when I thought about a rich real estate mogul from Orange County coming up to Red Bluff, what kind of a car he might have. But I was kind of imagining, you know, a cherry red Ferrari or perhaps a silver Bentley or a gold-plated Tesla. A little later that week, however, Chuck Ford and Pat Ford came driving into Red Bluff in a rented Yugo. You remember those cars from Yugoslavia that were mostly made of, of uh, chewing gum and dental floss? And yes, that was the car he drove into town. I, I said, Chuck, nice car, sarcastically. He looked me in the eye and he said, Graham, I spend all of my money on new church developments to the glory of the kingdom of God. I thought he's joking, but no, he was 100% truthful about that. For the next 15 years, Chuck Ford and I would start two new church developments. When I say start two new church developments, we met with city councils and mayors and presbyteries and synods and raised money if I could write John Steinbeck's book, Travels with Charlie, and rewrite it, it would be an apt title for the book that Charles Ford and I were able to write together. We started the church in Paso Robles. Highlands Church, many of you have visited it. This was their outdoor service a couple of weeks ago. My brother Jamie is now the pastor of Highlands Church. Thousands of people have come to Christ through that church Hundreds of people have been baptized, adults have been baptized in that church. We started a new church in Camarillo, California, Mission Street Church. Here is Joe Ba and Tony in the band, and they now meet in an art studio in Camarillo, and it is such a vital church led by Mickey Fenn, and hundreds of people have come to Christ through that church, baptisms in the ocean, so much fun. But on a personal note, I have to say the thing that I'm going to miss most about Chuck Ford is that he believed in me even when I had stopped believing in myself. And I will always, always be grateful for Chuck for what you did for me. Thank you. God love you, Chuck Ford, and I'm going to miss you. But if I had to boil the philosophy of life for Chuck Ford down to one sentence— I spent a lot of time with him through the years. I've been thinking and praying about this. If there was a mission sentence for Chuck Ford's life, it would be this, that people who have been given the gift of wealth must give a proportionate amount away, not just in money, but in good deeds, in hard work, and in Christ-focused service. So I want to read that quickly again. People who have been given the gift of wealth must give a proportionate amount away, not just in money, but in good deeds and hard work and Christ-focused service. And when we talk, by the way, about people who have wealth, that is most of us watching this morning. A recent study by Pew Charitable Trusts found that 56% of Americans were in the world's high-income group in 2011, living on more than $50 a day compared with 7% of the global population. That means if you are making more than $50 a day, you are in the 56 percentage of wealthy people in the world. Now, we need to be careful here. There are people in our county who are hungry today. There are people in our city and in our neighborhoods who, who don't have enough food to eat or close. And that is why I was so proud of our missions team led by Rodrigo and uh, Beth Frickberg and the hundred people who came out. These are clothes that we packed off to our friends who need clothes this Christmas. So let's look at that sentence one more time. This is Chuck Ford's mission sentence. People who have been given the gift of wealth must give a proportionate amount away, not just in money, 
but in good deeds and in hard work and in Christ-focused service. Now, if Chuck Ford was to pick a text for us to finish this stewardship series, if he was here today, he would pick the text that I chose, by the way, many months ago. This is one of those God moments when you find a text that you've been planning on preaching, and then God takes Chuck Ford home on that same week, and you get to focus on it that weekend. So here is the text. Now, just to give you a little background, it's perfect because Paul is the mentor. He is the Chuck Ford, and Timothy is the young pastor. In a sense, he's Graham Baird. And Paul is trying to encourage Timothy in this new church that Paul started in Ephesus many years before. And Timothy is doing a pretty good job, but he wants to encourage Timothy. Now, this will probably be one of the last letters that Paul writes to Timothy. Many scholars, by the way, believe that 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus are actually all the same letter, but different versions of them. So this is This is Paul's last advice to Timothy. And this is the last sentence of the letter that he sends to Timothy. This is his parting advice. And this is what God wants us to hear today. He tells Timothy to tell the church, teach those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. Now, I'm sorry to continue to pepper my message with ideas from Chuck, but I remember Chuck continually believed throughout his life that wealth automatically creates a sense of arrogance in all people who have it. He said it's just an automatic. People who have wealth, and again, that's most of us, people who have wealth automatically become a little bit arrogant unless they counterbalance that with generosity and with good deeds. That's the only remedy. If you will, that's the only vaccine against arrogance, and that is to be generous and to do good deeds. But then Paul tells Timothy that this. He tells them, and also tell them not to put their hope in wealth. Their hope in wealth. Now next week, <coughs> excuse me, is our first of our Advent series in 2020. Can you believe it? Advent begins this next week. And Jane will be preaching our kickoff message for our Advent series, and our theme this year is Hope Wins. But hope is a radical new idea in the history of religion and in the history of philosophy. And we will take a look at hope and how radical it is. But one thing we might begin that series with a week before is to say that what Paul is saying here is that wealth will not bring us hope because, he said, it is so uncertain. It's so uncertain. It might be actually one of the the great lies that most humans fall prey to. The idea that the more wealth that we surround ourselves with, the more certain and secure we can be. What Paul would say is that is not true. Just to give you one example, a couple weeks ago, I talked about Netflix and how most of us were in our houses watching Netflix shows, and that the stocks for Netflix were going way, way up. The next day, the next day, stocks plummeted for Netflix. It was when Pfizer came out with their announcement for a new vaccine, and so I suppose people worried, well, maybe people won't be in their homes forever watching Netflix shows. By the way, never take stock advice from me. I'm just not that good at that. But How uncertain wealth is. One of the wealthiest people in the world this last year is a man named Warren Buffett. He also happens to be extremely generous. But Warren Buffett lost $50 billion last year in Berkshire Hathaway. Billion. He's never had such great losses in the world. Warren Buffett is considered also one of the wiser people. I think it Costs about around hundred thousand dollars just to have lunch with him, but uh, you know Warren Buffett, his his motto in his life is rule number one: never lose money. Rule number two: never forget rule number one. But Warren Buffett would have to admit, especially after a year like this, that wealth is so uncertain. But where 
should the people in Ephesus put their hope. Paul tells Timothy to tell them to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. I just love that that Paul and God use the word enjoyment here. Yes, God cares about our enjoyment. Remember that this next week. And he tells them instead, tell them to do good and to be rich in good deeds and generous and willing to share. Sounds a little bit like Chuck Ford's mission sentence. Let's just take each of these ideas by themselves. Tell them to do good. We have many doctors in our congregation, in our community, and any doctor or nurse who begins the profession knows that you have to take the Hippocratic Oath. And anyone who has studied medicine or taken the Hippocratic Oath knows the most famous line is, do no harm. The Hippocratic Oath was actually written in 275 A.D., by Hippocrates himself, and it's quite an interesting oath. It says a lot more things. But really, what Paul is telling Timothy here is not, don't tell them to just do no harm. No, tell them to do good. Tell them that their lives are like the great scales of justice outside the Supreme Court, that they must do more good with their life than bad. Tell them to do good. And then he tells them, be rich in good deeds. I love this. The idea is that maybe all of us have savings and checking accounts, and we check out our savings and checking accounts to see how that is, to see our balance statement, but we also have a good deeds checking account. And one of the things that this COVID crisis has revealed is how many billionaires there are in the United States in good deeds deeds. Let me just share with you a story of one of them. This is a picture of Mary, who is a nurse in the Northeast and has served in that community through the height of the COVID crisis. Mary worked on a modest income five days a week, but when she wasn't volunteering, uh, she wasn't working on the sixth day, she was coming in on Saturday and volunteering in the hospital. This is her story. She said, you know, I've been a critical care nurse for over 30 years. My education and my training had prepared me well for my career as a nurse. But she says no college course, textbook, or amount of experience could ever have prepared me for what I was about to encounter as I faced the new reality of this being a COVID nurse. I thought, she said, I was prepared to handle any health crisis but I quickly realized that I was not prepared for this. She goes on to talk about the number of ways that she was not prepared. She says, lastly, and probably the most profound is that I wasn't prepared to watch colleagues across the world and healthcare systems we depended on crumble and yet shine under the wrath of COVID. If you know a healthcare worker, she said, give them a hug. They need it. Mary, on behalf of this congregation, we give you a great, big, socially distanced hug. And we want you to know also that God has noticed and that you are richer than Warren Buffett in good deeds. The final thing that Paul tells Timothy to tell his church is be generous and willing to share. Every Thursday, I come down to the church, and these days, it's usually mostly just me, even though the other staff are coming and going at different times in the day. And the heat is off, so sometimes I feel a little like the character Yuri in Dr. Zhivago with my gloves on my hands writing away at my sermon. But I do think that the children who are right across the hallway in the preschool shared with me one of the most profound ideas this last week as I was writing my sermon. I asked God, give me an image for how to convey the generosity. And I heard the kids in the preschool say, sharing is caring. Sharing is caring. Sharing is caring. 
I swear it was God's voice from the children to all of us. Sharing is caring. And Paul says that when we share, when we do good deeds, when we do good works, we will lay up treasure for ourselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. In other words, the things that we do, the, do, the good deeds we do will last so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. I'll close with this. <clears throat> this last week, when I got the news of my friend Chuck's passing, it came to me through the voice of Chuck's grandson, Dane, who may be watching this morning from North uh, Newport Beach. And we thank you and we give our condolences to you, Dane. But as we were reminiscing about the life of Chuck Ford, Dane told me, you know, Graham, <clears throat> this is my first day back to work after a long time. And uh, every morning I would call my grandpa or my grandma and they would pray with me. And they're not here anymore. Would you pray with me? And I said, Dane, I'd be happy to. And so we bowed our heads and I want to offer the same prayer to you today that I offered Dane as we close this stewardship message. Dear God, thank you so much for the life of Chuck Ford. Thank you for his belief in me, even when I didn't believe in myself. Thank you for his good deeds, his generosity, for the new churches that he started, 22 of them. Thank you, Lord, that he is now starting his 23rd church in heaven as we speak. We pray that we would be more like him, that we would be more like Timothy, that we would be more like Paul, so that we can take hold of the life that is truly life. Amen. Thank you, Graham, once again for an amazing sermon. You are such a gifted preacher. And on this Thanksgiving week, we are so thankful for who you are in our midst. We come now to our time of, of offering where we thank our God uh, for all of the love that God gives uh, to us each week, all of the myriad of gifts, uh, and we have an opportunity to respond. This week, we have two ways that we can respond with our normal offering, where you can text to 84321, go on our website to the giving tab, or send in a check. But more importantly, uh, this week, as we plan uh, for next year, uh, we are hoping uh, that you uh, will remember to send your pledge card in and you have even a better opportunity. We're going to take those pledge cards after this service in the parking lot. I'm going to be there. Jane's going to be there. It's going to be a fun time. Uh, and I hear that if you come, you might even get some scones that used to be served at the coffee cafe. Anyway, uh, let us come in thanksgiving uh, to our amazing God with our tithes, our offering, and our pledges. Amen. Take my life and let it be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Take my feet and let let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let it sing always ever for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages. Take my 
We have an opportunity uh, this morning uh, to bring our thanksgiving uh, and our prayers of petition uh, to our God. Let us pray together. Please join me. Holy God, you who created the heavens and the earth, the snails and the gazelles, the dandelions and roses, inchworms and kittens and heirloom tomatoes, kites and ocean waves and all of the hues of the color blue, we are so grateful, grateful that we have a sense of your mysterious presence in our lives, grateful that you have given us life itself. Help us to live fully and abundantly into our calling to respond to your presence, to respond to your life, to respond to the love you give to us by reaching out into your world with your love for others. Work through us individually and as a church to strengthen the weak, encourage the fearful, calm the anxious, help heal the sick, and provide for those in need. May your love that never fails flow through us and through our church community, our church community, which is at the moment distant, but present, virtual, but still connected, apart, but still helping. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer for our church and our community. We thank you for the good news this week that coronavirus vaccines are on the way. We praise you uh, for the light at the end of the tunnel. But Lord, even as we hear that good news, we also hear that the virus is surging again. People are still dying. Continue to keep us vigilant and patient as we wait our turn in line to be vaccinated. Let the good news of vaccines on the horizon not send us into premature celebration, but instead encourage us to stay the course. Especially this Thursday, as we as a nation celebrate our National Thanksgiving Day, help us to stay safe as we gather with friends and family, as we thank you for all that you have done and the abundance of all that you have given to us. Lord, in recent weeks, we have been so consumed with our national elections, with the coronavirus, uh, 
this fall with fires that we haven't, haven't looked up to see what's going on beyond our borders. But as we do so today, we, we see that you have been at work there too. We thank you for peace in Armenia. We thank you for the accord that has been signed by uh, Russia and um, Arzazavan, uh, and we ask that you would make that not just a printed piece of paper, but a living document of peace. Be with your people in Armenia. And as we say that, gracious God, we are also aware uh, that there is a civil war that is raging in Ethiopia, where peoples are now spilling over from those borders into other lands. And so we ask you to bring your peace to lower anxieties in Ethiopia. These are your people, and they need your help as well. Gracious God, there, there are also to our south, there are hurricanes raging. Central America is, is wet and it's windy and uh, the, the, the winds have, have not just blown uh, smoothly through palm trees. So we ask you to be with the peoples of Nicaragua and uh, Guatemala and El Salvador uh, and Honduras. Especially be with those that we minister with there. Uh, be with Dr. Davila uh, and his clinic uh, in Honduras. And be with all of those faithful workers in faith and practice in Guatemala. These are your boots on the ground. These are your people who are bringing hope and love so that the peoples of, of Central America may once again turn towards you in thanksgiving and praise. We bring you these concerns that are on our hearts, and we pray them in the name and in the way that our Lord Jesus Christ taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen.
We hope you enjoyed our worship service today. We're so grateful that you joined us. And this is the communion table, the harvest table that we are celebrating this week. We know that many of you will be, many of you will be by yourselves around tables like this. Others of you will have small groups of people. But realize that our Lord is with you around the table, however many people are around your Thanksgiving table. But now the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.